Hello, hello everyone. I hope you all are having a great Tuesday evening. I'm just going to hang out here for a couple of minutes while we give some folks some chance to log in and kind of get started and watching. I uh, hope everybody's doing great. My name's Erin. I'm a dietitian. In today's tutorial, we're going to be walking through um, some information about fad diets. It's something that I get asked a lot. While we're kind of here just waiting for a couple more folks to join on, um, there's some folks on here that I know and there's some folks that I don't know. So if you all don't care, just kind of type in the comment box and just let me know what your fitness goals are or even just you know what you're hoping to get out of today um, everybody knows that the best way to prepare for a talk is to know to your audience so um, if you all don't care just kind of share those comments with me um, it won't be visible once we <laughs> post the video um, once it's downloaded but um, like I said just waiting for folks to log in here I got a couple more rolling in all right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, my name is Erin. I'm a registered dietitian here in the Lexington area. Um, we started this series last month and it's called Tuesday Tutorials where I basically just come on live and kind of talk about stuff nutrition based. Um, it went fairly well last time. Uh, basically, I just kind of started talking and then you guys kind of jumped in with questions. It's really your opportunity to kind of ask the experts. So with nutrition in particular, with any field really, but particularly with nutrition and the internet, uh, it's, it's a great combination, but it's also a deadly combination because there is so much information out there. There is just so much. And nowhere is that more true than when it comes to fad diets. Um, so things Things like the ketogenic diet, things like intermittent fasting, uh, before it was Atkins and Beachbody. There's a kind of all of the, and I know Beachbody is kind of a workout program too, so I'm not bashing it. I'm just saying <laughs> there's, there's kind of these trends and these fads. Um, and when we look at the actual research, you know, kind of what comes across, you know, your Google feed or your Facebook feed or whatever it is that you're kind of using to get the majority of your information, um, you know, there's, you kind of have to take all of it with a grain of salt, right? Because there is definitely truth in some of it. Um, there's some of it that's out there that's kind of absolutely true. I kind of taken it at, you know, at face value. There's other stuff that is not true at all. <laughs> um, there is stuff that we at one point in time thought was true and have kind of since learned through, you know, decades of research that maybe it's not as true as we once thought. Um, and then there's also stuff that is partially true, but take it out of context it's not entirely true um so just to kind of give you all you know a heads up of what we're in for is i'm going to kind of just start talking about this stuff but i really want you guys to jump in with comments and questions because as a dietitian i see patients you know day in and day out and this is the stuff i get asked far and away the most often um and like I said, I see a couple more people kind of just joined on here. If you guys wouldn't care, just type in the comments what your um, your goals are, what you're hoping to get out of today. Any specific questions as throughout the session while we're talking, feel free to just type away and I will do the best. I will warn you, my eyesight's getting a little bit bad. I'm getting old. But I will kind of take breaks periodically to see uh, what you guys are typing. So start off with just introducing yourself to me. Um, you don't have to give me any specifics about who you are or anything like that, but just kind of let me know, you know, hey, what are what questions do you have? What are your goals? What are you aiming for as far as fitness? Um, that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to take a break here and use my old eyes <laughs> to look at what we've got going on here. Okay, somebody's getting wedding dress ready. Yes, I know who that is. Um, and then let's see, get back to feeling healthier, happier with myself. Yes. All right, so we've got two brides on here. That's awesome. Congratulations. I'm also a bride-to-be. Um, we got engaged like the weekend before COVID erupted, which was really great because we got to spend this romantic weekend away and get engaged. But now we've done absolutely no wedding planning uh, because there's a, a global pandemic. I'm sure you guys can relate that... Um, you know, it, it is just not easy right now to be planning a wedding. Um, but looking good in that wedding dress is definitely important. Those are pictures that you're hopefully going to keep on your walls for, you know, years and years to come. Show your children, your grandchildren, etc., and whatnot. But you also want to feel your best, right? Like that is kind of the most important thing. I feel like that's something that gets so overshadowed so often in our diet culture, right? It is all about the size. It is all about the weight. It is all about being a certain BMI or a certain, you know, dress size 
exercise or whatever. And that is just, those are just metrics, right? Um, this same person, and I'm kind of a good example of this, I personally am heavier now than I've ever been in my entire life. And if you told me 10 years ago that I was going to gain 70 pounds, but look and feel better in my own body, I would have told you you were nuts, right? But the weight came from, you know, strength training, from muscle mass. Um, my fat mass stayed about the same, but like my figure and my shape just completely morphed. And that came from a lot of training, but it came from a healthy relationship with food too. And I think that's kind of what I really want to get to today is that most of these fad diets, you know, they're, they're trying to find a one size fits all prescription for either better health or often weight loss. And the two are not the same. Uh, we can do a whole nother section on that about how, you know, weight loss does not equal health, right? Weight loss does not equal pretty even. Weight loss does not equal worthwhile. Weight loss does not equal anything. It just means that you are weighing less on a scale that measures pounds and kilograms than you did previously. Um, it's a very simple metric. It has nothing to do with who you are, what you're worth, or honestly, in a lot of cases, how you look or how you feel. Um, you know, again, case in point, my BMI, I think right now is about 32. I'm very healthy. All of my blood work is normal. I don't look overweight. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no perfect size for everybody. And a lot of the, the metrics that we use to evaluate health and to evaluate size are very, they're truly very flawed. Um, but the diet industry has capitalized on that, right? So we all know that if you go to the doctor and your BMI is over a certain you know number, that it flags your chart as red or that that's somehow now associated with all these other risks for um, you know heart disease and diabetes. And there's certainly truth in that, right? Those are, there is correlational data to suggest that, but it's not causational, right? So your BMI does not necessarily mean that you are inevitably going to get diabetes unless you lose weight. That's not true at all. Um, but the these fad diets, so kind of things like the ketogenic diet or um, intermittent fasting, all these other, you know, kind of weight loss tactics, right? So like the weight loss industry is a billion dollar industry and it ranges from everything from supplements to you know cardiologists doing weight loss research kind of you know trying to make this prescription for a one-size-fits-all diet that's going to work for everybody um and and the fact of the matter is that's like trying to find i don't know a a perfect shoe that's going to fit everybody. That's never going to happen, right? Um, that's just not <laughs> how we as humans are built. We are unique. We're individual. So um, the way, you know, you approach, you know, your your diet portion of your health care goal should be individual as well. Um, so things like the ketogenic diet, um, intermittent fasting, those are kind of the two that I hear about the most often. That said, if you guys have questions about other diets or other things that I maybe haven't even heard of, please, please, please write me comments, ask me questions. Um, even if you're not comfortable doing it in a public forum, I totally get it. Um, but by all means, you know, send me a direct message on Instagram, send me an email. Um, all of that information will be available once I post this video. So please feel free to reach out for, to me if you have questions. I love hearing what kind of information is out there. Not because I want to sit here and shoot it down, but because I truly want to know, you know, I can't be effective as a counselor unless I'm meeting my patients where they're at. And I won't know where they're at if I don't know what kind of information they're coming across. So it really does help me. And sometimes there is interesting stuff that I really haven't even heard of yet. And it hasn't really kind of come up in the literature that I regularly review. Um, but I can take a deeper dive into it and kind of come up with it answers to those questions. Um, so kind of for the time today, I want to, you know, just kind of take a brief moment to kind of focus on particularly the ketogenic diet, because that was something I was really asked questions about last time. And then we'll also talk about intermittent fasting. And then the rest of the time is for whatever you guys uh, want to talk about or whatever questions you have. Um, okay, I see a question already rolling in about about intermittent fasting. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so actually, we'll start there. We'll start with intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting um, is kind of a broad net. Uh, it's, it's kind of a broad term, but basically what it is in a nutshell is you are going from periods of eating to periods of fasting. Um, and it is based off of this principle that evolutionarily humans did go through these periods of they were they would go through periods of kind of like feast and famine. And, and that's true. You know, humans evolutionarily were kind of nomadic tribal people. So there were times where there was abundant food. So kind of your feast. And then there were times where there wasn't abundant food. And that was kind of your famine. Um, 
the argument is that, you know, those kind of cycles is kind of how the human body evolved to to work kind of under optimal conditions, um, which, you know, to an extent is also true. You know, the human body did kind of evolve, you know, developed around its surroundings. Um, and that, that's kind of basically how it is optimally designed to function. Um, so the goal behind intermittent fasting is that, you know, now we live in a day and age where food is abundant, right? We have food everywhere um, in copious amounts. We are, we are for the most part, most people are not kind of without food. Um, or at least not, you know, sometimes not without, without healthful food. But, you know, there's typically, especially in this country, there's, there's plenty of food typically to go around. Um with that said, you know, those kind of evolutionarily evolutionary principles don't really apply anymore, right? Because we're like, okay, we're not really famining <laughs> to, to match our feast. We're kind of just feasting. Um, so the, the concept came up of like, okay, well, let's start introducing kind of a fixed fast, right? And that that fast can range anywhere. There's all kinds of different ways that people have done it and even ways that research has been done around it. Um, it can be a fast for anywhere from, you know, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours to all the way up to, I think the longest I've heard is like 72 hours. Um, you know, the most common way people, so then they kind of, you know, it's like, okay, well, this work as a weight loss diet uh, because we're essentially restricting calories, right? So weight loss, you are in a business of kind of cutting your calories. Well, if you cut the amount of hours in a day that you're actually spending eating, you're inevitably going to likely cut out some calories. Um, and that's going to, in theory, promote weight loss. And it is kind of a simpler approach to weight loss because you're not so fixated on one nutrient or avoiding certain foods. You know, the, the general principle is you kind of eat what you want during your eating window. And that can be really however long you determine it to be. Most people do what's called like an 8-16 fast, which means you eat for eight hours of your day and then you fast for 16 hours of your day. Um, you can go more extreme. So it would be like a four and a 20 where you eat, you only eat for four hours of your day and then you fast for 20. Some people even take it a step further and they're doing like, you know, two and 22. Um, some people will kind of just eat normally for say five days a week and then super restrict their calories to like 500 calories or less on two days a week. Um, some people will do things like, you know, eat normally for five days and then completely fast like for 48 hours. Um, None of those have ever, no one regimen has been shown to be more beneficial than any of the others. Um, intermittent fasting in general does help with weight loss. Um, we don't have a ton of clinical data yet that really kind of speaks to um, a lot of the metabolic resetting that, you know, some articles will kind of claim. There's really not a lot of evidence yet to say that that truly happens. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but we just don't have the evidence yet or it's not robust enough to where I would, you know, stake my claim and say, yes, it helps reset your metabolic clock. Um, I don't know that that we really have the, the science to back that up at this point. Um, that said, it does help with weight loss for some folks. Um, that said, you can also lose weight without intermittent fasting. So I tried intermittent fasting for, I think, two days and I hated it and I was miserable and I was grouchy. And everybody says like, oh, you just got to get through that period or whatever. And no, it was never going to happen for me. And the reason why it was never going to happen for me is because I am somebody, I am a breakfast eater. Okay. I have always been a breakfast eater. It doesn't matter what my day looks like. I always want breakfast. I wake up at five in the morning before I go to the gym and I'm already hungry. That is just my body. That is the way that it works. And then, like I said, I work out early in the morning. So trying to work out with no fuel, then, you know, getting through your workout and then not eating, you know, after your workout, that is just running your body into the ground. It's just, it's terrible. Um, I could, you know, kind of fast on the other end. So, you know, start eating at five and then cut myself off at like two in the afternoon, but that wasn't really practical either. Um, so for me, it, it really didn't work. I didn't, I didn't see any benefit. I, I wasn't happy with it. Um, that said, I have a large pool of clients who are just simply not breakfast eaters. They never have been. Um, and, you know, kind of one of the things they kind of start preaching to you when you first go to school to be a dietitian is like, oh, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, what we've kind of learned, honestly, over time is that breakfast really isn't necessarily the most important meal of the day. It is not so important to eat breakfast. It is true that people who typically eat breakfast 
do tend to lose more weight and have a better time maintaining it. We don't have a metabolic reason as to why that happens. Again, it's just correlational data. We notice that people who tend to eat breakfast tend to lose weight easier and struggle less to keep it off. Um, there's a whole lot of speculation as to why that is, but you know, for, for the sake of this, we don't really know why. We just know that it happens. Um, that said, I've known plenty of people who've done intermittent fasting and done just fine with it. They actually feel better. Um, they make more cognizant choices with their lunch and with their dinner. Um, so the typical way to do it is to kind of, you know, do like an eight hour window. Most people just kind of skip breakfast, start eating around noon, then eat kind of lunch and dinner and stop eating around 7 p.m. Like I said, you could definitely shift that up. So you could start eating, you know, at eight in the morning and then you would just cut yourself off around like four in the afternoon. So you would basically be eating breakfast and lunch and kind of skipping dinner. But the goal is that you have a continuous window of time where you are eating and then a continuous longer window of time where you were fasting. Um, how you do it does doesn't really seem to matter too much. I will say that doing things like 24 hour fast, 48 hour fast, that's just dumb. Um, <laughs> and and, and I, I don't use that word very often, but there's, there's no benefit to that. If anything, it's going to slow down your basal metabolic rate. Um, so it's going to actually change the way in which your body uses calories to where it uses calories more efficiently, but by using them more efficiently, it's burning fewer. Um, it also can kind of cause some damage because you're not going Going through all of the metabolic processes that your body needs to in a day because you're not getting sufficient calories to do so. Um, so I would definitely, you know, from a dietitian standpoint, as long as you are meeting your calorie goal, and that's kind of where meeting with a true registered dietitian who is licensed, who knows, you know, how to do these calculations and how to account for various factors that are going to, you know, play into how you, the individual or the patient are going to be eating, um, you know, that's where we come in really handy. So, you know, for me, I would determine your calorie goals. And then if you are interested in doing something like intermittent fasting, we can talk about it. We can talk about kind of, you know, what your work schedule is like, what your workout schedule is like, you know, what, if anything, you know, if you're making meals for kids or, you know, other family or whatever, you know, is it going to realistically fit into your life? Because at the end of the day, you know, if your goal is to lose weight or have more energy or feel better, you need to eat the right amount of calories and you need to eat balance. That's, the simplest, take it to the bank every time. That's pretty much all I'm going to tell you is that you need to eat the right amount of calories. And what that is, is going to be determined entirely on who you are, what you are, what your goals are, but you also need to eat balance and everybody needs to eat balance. Um, so as long as you are doing those two things, whether you are doing it through like a fasting type regimen or you're just doing it, um, you know, eating kind of, you know, the standard three meals a day, either way is going to, is going to help. Um, you're going to, you're going to feel great. You're going to sleep better. Um, you're going to have more energy that, that to me is what the science has shown that, that it helps a lot. Um, that is, that is where the money is, right? It is, is that balance really more than anything else. Um, you know, when it comes to more extreme diets and now I'll kind of get into my, to my keto bashing, if I, if you will, um, so when it comes to extreme diets that cut out, and I don't really care what kind of extreme diet it is. It can be keto, which typically cuts out carbs. Um, there's also kind of extreme like low fat diets. There's high protein diets. There's low protein diets. In the absence of any type of clinical indication for it, um, I really don't see a need to go to that extreme. Now, there are certain people, for example, kidney patients who really just their body cannot tolerate that much protein. So we do put them on a low protein diet. But again, that is is regulated and kind of monitored and managed through the help of several licensed clinicians, not just, you know, the individual like, okay, we'll go on a low protein diet and like, here you go, good luck. Uh, that's not how we do that. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the extremes of cutting out, you know, whole food groups, for example, like cutting out fruit or cutting out grains or cutting out starches, um, that's really not what we're about. Um, and, and honestly, it's not beneficial, right? It's not even just like, oh, well, I'm a dietitian and that's not what dietitians do. It's it's not healthful. Um, what we have shown time and time again is that, you know, everybody wants to find this one nutrient or this one thing that is like going to, you know, either cure all of your ailments or, <laughs> you know, find or that's, you know, going is the one bad thing that as long as you take this thing out of your diet, then like you're good for, for life. And there, you're never going to find it uh, because it doesn't exist because there are so 
so many factors that affect, you know, how your body operates. Uh, then it changes daily. Um, so, you know, kind of going to those extremes, whether it's, you know, low carb or avoiding certain foods because you think that they're bad for you. There's no really, there's no food that's bad for you. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'll probably say it every time. So if you guys are locking in regularly, you're going to get sick of hearing it. But um, there's, there's really truly no food that's bad for you. Um, and I want you to kind of take a minute and let that sink in. Like there is no food that is bad for you. There is, unless you're allergic to it, there is no food that is bad for you. You can eat anything you want and anything you want can be part of a healthful diet. I promise you that. I've seen it happen. I've done this a long time. Um, you know, kind of there, there, there aren't, there's no secrets. There's no food that's, you know, magically good for you. There's no food that's magically bad for you. Um, I saw a couple more people just kind of like logged in. I think we had some shifting. So, um, if you all are just logging in, if you don't care to kind of just type in, I know some of you, but if you would just type in kind of what your goals are. Uh, we've talked about intermittent fasting. We talked a little bit about, um, keto and kind of some of the more restrictive diets. Um, Definitely open up the floor to anyone who wants to kind of start asking questions. I'm happy to to address. Um, I know that I was asked a question last time about um, the glycemic index. So um, the glycemic index is um, we don't really use it a whole lot um, just because it's it's kind of cumbersome. Um, but that said, the the goal behind the glycemic index is to just develop a scale essentially to kind of help us determine how different carbohydrates function in the body. Um, so you guys may have heard that like not all carbs are created equal. And to an extent, that's true, right? So all carbs do eventually become glucose in your body. So it doesn't matter if it started out as a potato, if it started out as a cupcake, it eventually becomes glucose in your bloodstream. Um, the difference is how quickly that transition happens. So what the glycemic glycemic index does is it takes, you know, if you were to take a set amount um, of, of a certain food, so like let's say a potato versus a set amount of, um, I don't know, rice, um, what you do is you take 50 grams of each of those and they basically measured, you know, how long it took for you to see a rise in blood glucose. Um, what that has to do with is just kind of the complexity of the carbohydrates that are involved. So um, different carbohydrates take longer to be digested and broken down. So you guys may have heard a term simple carbohydrate versus complex carbohydrate. Simple carbohydrates are going to be things like your kind of simple sugars. Um, it's not that they're bad for you. They just do tend to get absorbed very quickly because they're all already kind of in a sugar form. So it's basically the way most of them work is that you have like two sugar molecules that are stuck together like this, and then all your body has to do is break them apart and then bloop, they're glucose. So it happens very, very quickly. Um, if you have more complex carbohydrates, you know, imagine kind of like that rubber band ball that maybe you have on your desk that's got like a thousand different little like kinks in it. Your body has to peel apart all of that and then cut it up into little chunks to get it into the glucose form. So that's kind of what takes a little bit longer. So that process is that those things will not raise your blood sugar as quickly. Um, Raising your blood sugar fast or slow is not necessarily good or bad, but when we come to, you know, athletic training in particular and like workouts and kind of fueling for your workout and after your workout, you know, there are times where you want something that maybe fuels you a little bit quicker versus something that may fuel you a little bit slower. Um, so last time we were kind of talking a little bit about fueling for your workout and fueling for recovery um, in the context of macronutrients. So kind of to add on to that, uh, you know, you want something that's kind of a lower glycemic index food. So that's going to be something that um, absorbs slower. You want that like prior to your workout, an hour or more before your workout. Anywhere kind of 30 minutes or closer to your workout, that's when you want your kind of your quick fuel, because that's going to be the stuff that your body's burning immediately. Um, depending on what you're doing, how much you need is going to vary. Um, so, you know, if you're doing kind of, you know, explosive type of hit workout, you may want kind of more kind of quick carbs on board. Whereas if you're doing more weightlifting, you may not need those quick carbs because you're not really doing explosive movements. Your body's really relying on glycogen at that point. Um, 
if you are recovering from a workout, a lot of times you actually do want those quick absorbing carbs because if your body is truly just spent, again, it's going to depend on what you did, but, um, you know, if your body is just spent kind of getting those good kind of quick carbs in there helps you kind of feel better immediately. Um, and then what, then you also want kind of some protein and a slower absorbing carb. So a lower GI carb, um, to kind of help sustain you then to kind of help continue. So you kind of get that initial glucose spike to kind of replenish what you've burned, but then you also want kind of the, the more complex carbohydrates to kind of then stay on board and continue to replenish those muscles. Because basically no matter how you've worked your muscles, you've worked the glycogen out of them and you've kind of in a sense damaged the muscle. So what you're trying to do then is rebuild. And in order to rebuild your body needs that kind of consistent source of fuel. So you want kind of the quick kind of initially, but then you also want the slower to kind of um, even out the workout um, or even out the, the blood sugar levels. So that kind of wraps up most of what I had to talk about tonight. If you guys have any questions, please type them in the comment box. Or if you are watching this at another time, by all means, feel free to add comments. The comments will switch, but that's okay. Um, or always feel free to inbox me or send me messages. Um, I love hearing from patients and clients and hearing just kind of about what kinds of stuff you guys have come across. Um, I'm also, we're going to start doing these once a month. So it's going to be the second Tuesday of every month. Um, the next one will be on September 8th, uh, which is going to be the day after Labor Day. So um, I will take any kind of suggestions. I'll kind of put out a poll and a quiz like I did the last time just to kind of see, you know, what's out there, what you guys are wanting to know more information about. Like I said, this is just my kind of like, I can talk about food all day long. So I really just want to tailor it to what everybody here wants to hear about, um, what's, what's interesting you. Um, of course, if you are interested in kind of, you know, getting a deeper dive into your own situation and what works might work best for you by all means you know feel free to reach out I do do one-on-one -on -one counseling um, or you can head over to my website which is new you uh, for for more information about pricing and packages and all that good fun stuff so um, looks like nobody else has any questions which is fine um, but that said I hope you guys have a great night and I will talk to you soon have a great one